Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, good morning. My name is John, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Christchurch Stockport Online. Everything you're going to need for today's service is either going to appear on the screen before you, or if you head over to our Facebook page and join our church group, you can download a service sheet and you'll also find resources there for families and children. Now, today is Palm Sunday. That is the Sunday we remember Jesus coming to Jerusalem starting Holy Week leading up to Easter. And so we're going to pray the collect, the prayer for Palm Sunday now. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
last couple of weeks, Jane Robinson has been taking us through part three of the New City Catechism, thinking about some of the practical aspects of the Christian faith. And this morning we're continuing to think about prayer in question number 40. This is our series where we look at big truths of the Bible. And we're currently talking about prayer. And last week we mentioned how sometimes it can be hard to pray because we might not know where to begin, begin or what to say. So this week's question might help us think through that. This is question 40. What should we pray? Where do we begin? How do we start to pray? Sometimes even when we speak to our friends or family, we might want to share stuff, but it doesn't quite come out or it might be jumbled or we don't quite know where to begin. That happens in prayer too, to God. Well, what should we do? What should we pray? Our answer, the whole word of God directs us in what we should pray. The Bible is the word of God. And the Bible is full of examples of people praying. What should we pray? The whole word of God directs us in what we should pray. Now, in the Old Testament, in the bit of the beginning of the Bible, there's a record of lots of people praying. In the middle of the Bible, there's a book called the Psalms, where people pray through all sorts of emotions, when they're feeling happy, sad, and even when they're feeling confused and doubtful about God, they're still praying and working out what it looks like. And then there's a New Testament as well, where there's more people that pray to God. And in fact, we can even read about how Jesus prayed too in the New Testament. What should we pray? The whole word of God directs us in what we should pray. In fact, Jesus even gives us an example in the New Testament in a book called Matthew. He gives us an example of a prayer. You might have heard of it before. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And if you haven't read it, or even if you have before, read it for yourself. What should we pray? The whole word of God directs us in what we should pray. The Bible is the word of God. It helps us to know how to pray. Read it. Thanks, Jane. Knowing that the whole word of God directs us in what we should pray, uh, let's now spend some time praying with the help of that word. In particular, we're going to be using the framework of the prayer that Jesus himself taught in Matthew chapter 6, the, the Lord's Prayer. So let's spend some time now in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, Lord God Almighty, we praise you that we can call you the majestic, sovereign, almighty and holy God. Father, we praise you for this wondrous reality won for us by Jesus. And we ask then that by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would truly live as your children, praising and worshipping you in such a way that your name might be lifted up and known here in Stockport and beyond. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Father, there's still so much of our world right now that seems out of control, so much anxiety and stress. And yet through it all, we pray that your will be done. That through whatever season or situation that we find ourselves in, that as we learn studying the life of Joseph, that we would trust in your sovereign goodness and that we would know that you are working all things for our good. Remind us then, however bad might feel, things might feel however bad things get here and now the fullness of your kingdom is yet to come give us today our daily bread father we continue to pray for the end of this costly and consuming grip of covid19 we thank you that graciously here in the uk we have seen cases fall and vaccinations increase but we ask that that would be the same and would be true for the whole world 
And Father, whilst COVID is pressing, we continue to pray for daily bread, that, that we recognise that we are totally dependent on everything for you. So we ask that food would be available to all, that healthcare be accessible to all, that love and kindness be extended to all. But most urgently, Father, we pray for spiritual food, for spiritual nourishment, that you would fill us with the gospel of peace. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Father, we're truly sorry for our lack of trust in you, that we trust with what our eyes can see rather than living with eyes of faith. Give us strength then to put all our hope in you and perseverance to stay the course that you laid out for us. We're going to just pause for, for a brief moment of quiet and then together we'll say the prayer of confession that appears on the screen. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and confess the grievous sins and wickedness which we have so often committed by thought, word and deed. Against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your anger and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are deeply sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time onwards we may always serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, protect us from an excess of fear or doubt that causes us to sin. Instead, instill within us a godly fear and deliver us from the devil's attempts to divide and conquer us. Father, we ask that as we walk out of this COVID nightmare, that we, as we walk into the future with you, that you would bring us together and make us stronger for your glory. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
This morning's reading is Acts chapter 9. I'm going to be reading from verse 1 through to verse 31. And as always, if you don't happen to have a Bible at hand, if you follow the link to Bible Gateway in the description of this video, you'll be taken to the passage on the internet. Now, Kelvin's going to come and read the passage, and then following that, Matt will come and encourage us to think through some more mission matters. Our reading this morning is Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 31. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were travelling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptised, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying He is the Son of God and all who heard him were amazed and said Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose? to bring them bound before the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. 
When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit it multiplied. Well good morning and let me add my welcome to that of John's it's great to uh, welcome you with us this morning. Uh, let me pray and then we'll dive into this passage of the Bible together. Almighty God we pray that as we read this, your word, as we consider it, as we ponder it, uh, that, Lord, you would speak to us. Uh, transform us by your word into the people uh, that you want us to be. Uh, Father, help us to see your grace and mercy towards your people. Help us to delight uh, in the mission that you've called us to join you on. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, as we hear your word, that we would then go out and live your word to the ends of the earth. Amen. Uh, well, uh, do come with me to uh, Acts chapter 9 as we uh, carry on our journey through this book of Acts, seeing how God's unstoppable plans to spread the gospel and grow the church unfold. Uh, and we're doing this series in order that we might be better equipped and encouraged in our great commission of making and teaching and sending out disciples of Jesus. And this morning we come to a Bible event that is, is actually pretty famous as Bible events go. Uh, as Saul, who some of you may know better as, uh, as Paul, the guy who under God wrote much of the New Testament, uh, has his road to Damascus moment. Uh, Jesus is going to sh uh, show up to Saul and literally uh, put him on straight street. As Jesus changes the whole direction of Paul's life, he's going to turn in verse 3 from his own way into walking, verse 2, in God's way. Now, what we read here is a life-changing, church-changing, Bible-changing moment in God's unstoppable mission. Right, so let's take a look at it. And I don't want to assume from the off that you know much about Saul as we head into the passage. So uh, let's start with him. Uh, Saul, the man on a mission. And it's a mission that is pretty well summed up back in chapter 8 and verse 3, as Luke, the author of Acts, introduces us to Saul following Saul's approval of Stephen's stoning. We're told rather ominously back there that Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. That's Saul's mission. Destroy the church. Uh, for Saul, this Jesus following sect of Judaism, with all their talk of uh, resurrection and their fanciful blasphemous claims that Jesus was God, were to be crushed. And verse 1 of our passage makes clear that he wasn't satisfied with just uh, crushing the uprising in Jerusalem. No, his mission was going to take him wherever it must, even perhaps to the ends of the earth, in order to quash all who claim to follow, as verse 2 puts it, the way. So verse 1, Paul goes and he gets authentication from the high priest to go to Damascus and start crushing the church there. Uh, and look how it's described, verse 1. But Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul, still breathing threats. 
and murder. Uh, Paul's venom towards these Christians was as natural to him as the breath that you just took. Uh, You didn't need to engineer it, did you? It just happens. And that's telling us that Paul's natural instinct towards Christian is is that he just breathes out, naturally breathes out hatred. Uh, Verse 13 tells us Paul is evil. Verse 26, he was terrifying. You see, don't misunderstand this conversion that we're going to read of. This is not a conversion moment that is anything uh, trivial. Because Paul was as anti-Jesus, anti-church, anti-the gospel as anything you could possibly be. He's not engaged in ethnic cleansing here, but he is involved in creedal cleansing, isn't he? Cleansing a whole belief system. As one person I read on this puts it, Paul, backed by the authorities, is running a one-man terror cell against the early believers. This is a powerful man with all the weight of the religious authorities on his side, there to crush Christ's church. Paul is a man on a mission. And yet, it is to this powerful, scary, evil, most anti-Jesus of blokes whom Jesus decides to show up to. Verse 3, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. In this extraordinary moment, Saul, who up until now has been blinded to the truth of the resurrected Jesus, is now, verse 8, blinded by the resurrected Jesus as Jesus shows up and transforms Saul. And it really is a full transformation. Because look at this. This is really uh, amazing. This is something to get your head around, really. You may have missed it, actually, when it was being read to us. But but look what happens. Uh, Jesus, he he gets on with putting his plan in place. And he's obviously, because he's Jesus, he's engineered things pretty well. Uh, And as in verse 11, he he sends the the now sightless Paul to Straight Street. Uh, And I think Straight Street is the intentional destination because... What is it? Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Turn away from from evil. Turn around, be transformed. Uh, This is Paul's straightening out moment. And as he waits on straight street, well, Jesus gets his usual means of mission, his church mobilised in the person of Ananias. And as you meet Ananias, just pause for a moment and imagine being Ananias here. So first up, you've got Jesus who turns up to you in in a vision. And that's got to be awesome, right? Jesus shows up. And so Ananias is all like, yeah, here I am, Lord, ready to serve, Lord, whatever you want, Lord. And then there's verse 11. Great, says Jesus. Well, if you wouldn't mind, thanks, Ananias, could you just pop along to Judas's house? There's, There's a guy there, Saul of Tarsus. I've told him in a vision that you'll pop along to lay hands on him. So would you mind going and doing that? Saul? Saul, replies Ananias. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you've got your wires crossed it. You can't possibly be meaning Saul of Tarsus. He's the bloke who hates us, Jesus. You've got him wrong. Like verse 13, he's evil. He's been sent to arrest us. He's been ravaging the church. I think you must have got it wrong, Lord. You can't mean Saul of Tarsus, surely. But no, verse 15, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing, doesn't he? The Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And now this, this is the moment, the amazing, extraordinary thing that I mentioned a moment ago. This is this is what I don't want you to miss here. This is how big a transformation of Paul we're talking about. Look at verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me to you so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you see it? Did you see what is extraordinary in these words? This Saul, 
who up until now has been the enemy of the church, the enemy of Ananias, the enemy of Jesus, the man who just a few verses earlier we're told was breathing threats and murder, is now made a brother. Brother Saul. God's enemy becomes part of God's family. The ravager of the church now becomes part of that church. The one who was verse 3 on his way now belongs verse 2 to the way and has a new purpose. He has a new mission. No longer will he destroy the church. No, now he is verse 15 to carry the name of Jesus before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He's to grow the church. Which is exactly what he begins to do in verse 20. As in verse 29, the hunter becomes the hunted, all for the name of Jesus. And through it all, verse 31, what happens? The church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace as it was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. Saul, the man on a mission, meets with the risen Lord Jesus, becomes a brother and receives new orders. It is a wonderful story, a conversion moment, a work of power and grace. And I just want to spend the rest of our time considering and reflecting on a handful of things as we ask, what do we learn from all of this? And firstly, I want us to see that this episode tells us that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I mean, you can't miss that really, can you, in this passage? Look at verse 1 or verse 5. There's twice in verse 10, verse 11, verse 13, verse 15, 17, 27, 28 and 31. We're told Jesus is Lord. And that word Lord, actually, although being mentioned so many times in this passage, it's not actually a word that comes up that many times in the book of Acts. It's not overly used. And yet here you can't miss it. As Jesus demonstrates here that he is in total control of all situations, all circumstances. That he is in charge of his mission, that he's in charge of those who would oppose him and his mission. Oh, Saul had the power of the state behind him. He had letters from the high priest. He had the power of arrest. He must have looked pretty authoritative, right? I mean, verse 14 tells us that he was authoritative. No wonder everyone is scared of him. But what is unmissable here is that Jesus has far more authority, far more power than Saul. And that's something that Saul realises pretty quickly on in this whole narrative, isn't it? As he's knocked to the ground, as he's scrabbling around Silas, uh, Silas, he says, who are you, Lord, in verse 5? In other words, in this relationship, you, whoever you are, are the Lord. You, You now get to call the shots. I'm no longer verse 2 heading my way. I'm now following the way, your way. I'll go away, you lead. In this moment of conversion for Paul comes a change of allegiance, a change of direction, a change of rule, a change of Lord. Which means for us, then that mission means calling people to following you, Lord. If you're not a Christian listening in, you're really welcome and we're glad that you're here and you're glad that you're listening. But you need to know that to become a Christian will mean needing to accept that from now on Jesus calls the shots. It's to say like Ananias in verse 10, here I am Lord. And then to back it up as Ananias does in verse 17 by doing what the Lord Jesus calls you to do and being who the Lord Jesus calls you to be, even when that's uncomfortable. Which means if you're a Christian uh, listening in today, then the question that this raises for us is, well, how are you getting on with living with Jesus as Lord? Whose way, which way are you following? Your way or the way? Where do you need to repent and come under the Lordship of Jesus today? When you became a Christian, part of that was an acceptance that you were no longer going to live life your way, but you were going to go Jesus' way. Where does the rubber hit the road for you? What what does that look like for you? Secondly, though, first, Jesus is Lord. Secondly, Jesus' grace is very, very big. 
just look at verse 13 again and the incredulity that Ananias shows to the idea of Saul being the one whom he must go to. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Oh, look at the response of the crowds in verse 21. And all who heard Paul were amazed, Saul were amazed and said, Is not this man who made havoc in Jerusalem um, of those who called upon this name? Has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? Or look at the fear of the disciples in verse 26. They were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. And that's because time after time Saul was the last person you would imagine ever becoming a Christian. I mean, humanly speaking, all appearances tell us that he is the least deserving of it. He is the last person who would become a Christian. He's been murdering Christians, dragging them from their homes. He's an outright enemy of Jesus. And yet it's him who Jesus chooses to be, verse 15, his chosen instrument. Jesus acts in order to welcome this sinner, Saul, into the family. Jesus' death was big enough and sufficient enough to save even the self-proclaimed King of sinners, chief of sinners. You see, if you're somebody listening in today who thinks, well, there's no way God could accept me. Man, I'm too sinful, I've done too much, I'm ashamed of, I've rejected Jesus all my life, I've actively mocked God and the church, I'm I'm too far gone for God. Well, actually, this tells if Ananias can call Saul brother because of Jesus' grace towards Saul, then there is hope for you and me also, right? Jesus welcomes enemies as friends, as family, no less. So don't fear ever being rejected by Jesus. Instead, turn from your way, come to the way and walk in his way and claim his grace and forgiveness for yourself. And again, if you're a Christian, this ought to give us massive confidence, right, in our missional endeavours. Saul is the person whom no one expected to ever become a Christian. He's your colleague at work who constantly berates you for being a Christian. He's the atheist on social media who mocks and belittles Christians. He's the parent who thinks you've lost your mind for becoming a Christian. He's the angry politician who hates all that Jesus stands for. He's the uh, bully at school, the thug of the town, the vindictive, mean-hearted enemy. He's the person that you know who blindly and persistently lives their life in their own way on their terms without recognition of the God who made them. But here's the thing. When the resurrected Jesus shows up, then even the most hardened enemies of Christ will fall to their knees, change their way, their whole view of life. As they find not condemnation, but forgiveness and welcome. A passage like this, friends, ought to drive us to pray for those whom we would never dream could become Christians. We ought to be praying that in Jesus, that Jesus in his grace would show up to those whom we least expect could be saved, that they would become a trophy of God's grace. God's grace is big enough. I mean, after all, he's saved and rescued and called you and I. Does that not encourage you? And as we're talking about encouragement, did you notice the slightly odd way Jesus speaks in verse 4? I mean, look at verse one again, just just quickly. Saul is breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. But now look at verse four. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul is breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Why are you persecuting me? How cool is it to think that Jesus identifies so closely to his church that an attack on them is an attack on him? Jesus and the church are inextricably linked, which I hope once again should give us massive confidence to go and proclaim Jesus. Uh, I remember, um, I remember starting high school. Do you remember that feeling? Yeah, you were you were small, right, amid all of the the, the year elevens who were in the school. Our school had a sixth form as well, so we had year twelves and year thirteens. And I was nervous and totally overawed. Until, that is, some of my older sister's friends who were in the sixth form uh, saw me and really kindly started chatting to me and welcoming me. All of a sudden I felt protected and cared for and watched out for by the bigger kids. As the hard kids in my year walked by, I made sure they saw me talking to the sixth formers. And with them, I would think. My friends, Jesus says here, Christ, just stop up there with me. 
at the Lord of the universe. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So Christ just stop or go. Go with my authority. Go in my name. Brothers and sisters, we go on mission. We got to live and proclaim the gospel with the authority and the power and the identification of having the Lord of the universe walking with us. That's pretty encouraging, right? The church and Jesus are inextricably linked. Why do you persecute me, says Jesus? And finally, friends, mission is costly. I want to be upfront with you about this, and we've tried to be all the way through our Acts series just to let you know mission is costly. I mean, just glance at verse 16 or, or verse 23, mission is costly. And it stands to reason, right, doesn't it? Because if the, if, if the church and if Jesus are inextricably linked and the world rejected Jesus, well, we should be prepared for some pain. But in this passage, I am so struck by Ananias. He, he sat on my mind all week, actually. I just think... His faithfulness to Jesus' call on his life is amazing. I mean, firstly, he goes to the scariest man on the planet at the time in order to lay his hands on him. As my son would say, what a G! What a guy! Despite the fear, despite the challenge, despite the threat, Ananias counts the cost and he goes. But then what is so remarkable is that he doesn't just go. No, as we've seen, he calls Saul brother. Do you see how costly that could be to him? Here is a guy who likely knows some of the people who've been dragged off to prison by Saul. Who has heard the rumours, knows the threat, who up until days ago was hated by Saul. Like emotionally speaking, if this were a film, we'd be expecting him, willing him maybe, to get his revenge. This is, this is his chance, perhaps, to shiv Paul in the back. Get rid of him. Get rid of the threat. But how amazing is the grace of God? How powerful is the unity of the gospel that just as Jesus welcomes and forgives, well, rather than seek revenge, instead Ananias is now willing in Jesus and through Jesus' grace to accept Saul as a brother. I mean, it's amazing when you think about it. He's part of the family. And we've got to hear this because... Mission is costly. It may at times mean you and I welcoming as family those whom we might otherwise describe as enemies. I don't know who you would describe as an enemy. I hope you wouldn't describe many as an enemy, but we live in a pretty divided world, don't we? But this tells us that the saving work of Jesus breaks through fear and hatred and division. Pray for your enemies. Count the cost. And boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Welcome all who Jesus would welcome into the church. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Because who knows what your gospel legacy could be. Ananias. Ananias is never mentioned again in the Bible. He's got a bit part in many ways. But do you see how his boldness in following Jesus' call to go means that Paul, the great missionary, the church planter par excellence, the God-inspired author of the Bible, uh, letters that have transformed the lives of countless millions of people, receives the Holy Spirit and is transformed from being a man on his mission to being a man on God's mission. Mission unstoppable. And it only happens because Ananias goes and lays the, his hands on him as God breaks into Saul's life and transforms him. The church went, equipped by Jesus for the task. And somebody once told me the gospel, which means I get to tell you the gospel. What's your legacy? How cool is it that we get to be part of this great gospel movement? That Jesus is Lord. His grace is very, very big. He goes with you into mission. He unites the divided. And so despite the cost, let's get on board with Mission Unstoppable. Let's proclaim him to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, what a, an amazing thought to see that you can pour grace even on a man like Paul. 
we thank you that you have showed up to Saul and you, you transformed him. You made yourself known to him. That you call him to submit to the Lord Jesus as Lord. Father, we thank you for Ananias and his boldness in going to Paul and laying hands on him so that he could receive the Spirit. We thank you for his willingness to count the cost. Father, we thank you for the men and women who down the years have shared the gospel with us. That we might gather here around your word in the worship of your son, the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, help us to be a people who go not afraid, but go knowing that we have the power and authority of the Lord Jesus with us and help us to be a people who go even to the most unlikely of people. Help us to be quick to pray for them, quick to share the gospel with them. And Father, by our endeavours, won't you please uh, change our hearts and minds. May the Lord Jesus show up and transform people and bring them into his kingdom and may we be quick to welcome them, to accept them, uh, to call them brother uh, and sister. Amen. Well, uh, thanks so much for listening. Go well. Well, thanks, Matt. Our final hymn is a reminder to fix our sight, our vision on the Lord Jesus. Let's sing.
Well, a big thank you for joining with us this morning. To our regulars, growth teams are going to take a fortnight's break now for the Easter holidays. But really excitingly, we're going to be meeting together physically for Easter Sunday next week at Walthew House. Now, to book your place, head over to our website at www.christchurchstophut.com and fill out the booking form to book your place. Now, straight after this service, we're going to be holding a Zoom call where you're invited to connect with members of our church community. Uh, the details of how to dial in can be found in the comments section of this video, and we really would love uh, you to join with us. But as we finish this morning, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, amen. Thanks again. Keep on going. We're nearly there. And hopefully we'll see some of you in person next week.